Okay, so now we've seen the physical effect of time dilation, let's make something very similar with length contraction. So if you'll remember when we started to introduce the phenomena of time dilation, we started by saying, or a way we could start visually seeing where it's going to come from is by saying we take some fixed interval of proper time, which is fixed in our reference frame, and then we translate that into some other frame in which it's going to have now some non-zero dx piece that's going to have to contribute to the, the total line element. And so this is going to basically mean that our dt piece is going to have to increase to compensate. Remember, all because of the minus sign in the form of the line element. But now rather than working with intervals, I'm just going to draw a picture and we can now see this very nicely. So let's again just consider our positive quadrant. So we have our stationary observer and a boosted observer. So our boosted observer B. And now I'm going to do something, and now I'm going to use quite a really nice and fundamental fact that we've already seen. We realised that our line element was an invariant, and so regardless of the coordinate system we use, the line element isn't going to change. And so I can use that fact now to my advantage. If I just plot the line element on a figure like this, remember we could plot our points on which the line element has a constant value, and we could say, not consider some ds, but some delta s, look at a fixed separation, and if we start measuring these deltas from the origin, we can effectively just forget about them, and just plot these kind of level curves on which the line element is going to have a constant value. Hopefully you've seen me do this before, but now just plotting on this figure one of these s squared level functions, if you remember they were these hyperbole, so we have the kind of extremal cases when ds squared is equal to zero, and then we had the two hyperbole for when ds squared is negative, which we said were corresponding to time-like distances or distances that have a negative um, length from the origin. And then lastly, we had our positive ds squareds that we haven't really had too much to deal with up until now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plot on this figure one of these ds squared curves. So I'm going to plot the positive ds squared value. I'm going to plot the hyperbole of positive ds squared. And now I'm going to kind of quite wildly exaggerate the curvature of this ds squared just so I can emphasize my point. Okay, so in reality it will be some flatter hyperbole but just exaggerating it so we can have a clearer picture. So this line, this green line, is a curve on which the value of the line element is constant and also positive. And so we can now use this effectively as a kind of measuring stick on our picture. And we can use it to compare distances in two different reference frames. Because now essentially, any point on this curve is always going to have to have the same Minkowski separation from the origin. And because we're conveniently placing our coordinate systems with their origins together, we can directly correlate these two um, reference frames with this ds squared. So when we measure a distance 
or if we just pick a point on this ds squared, we can then measure its separation from the origin simply just by giving its coordinates in the frame. And so I'm now going to use this quite convenient trick, well it's not a trick, it's just a convenient utilisation of the invariance of the line elements. We can use this um, line element constant curve to effectively measure distances in both of these frames. So what I'm going to do now is I'm uh, going to demonstrate length contraction just simply on this figure. So I'm going to do this, I'm going to first of all define uh, a stationary rod. So I'm going to say that in our B frame we're going to have just some fixed stick with some length that just extends along the x-axis. So if I just draw the B frame from its reference perspective, this is now the x hat ct hat. So this is the frame B as if we were at rest in the B frame. And I'm going to define now a rod or really just a fixed space-like interval to just lie starting at the origin, one end at zero, and then one end at coordinate value x hat equals one. So this is going to be my fixed length, my rod if you like. And it's just going to have a length of delta L is equal to one, and this L symbol is what we usually associate with now a proper length because this is a stationary reference frame, we can say that this now a completely space-like distance, we can associate it with a proper quantity because it's in the rest frame, and we call that the proper length, in contrast to a proper time, which would lie completely along the time axis. So this is our rod, it's at rest in the B frame, and so the A-frame is going to see that rod flying past them with some velocity. And we're now going to see that this A-observer is going to think that this rod appears shorter than it actually is. So let me now translate this B-frame onto this figure. Remember we've boosted our axes. And now I can use the quite convenient fact that this rod is really just being described by a purely spatial interval. It just lies along the x-hat axis. And so we know that the end of the rod has to lie at the point x-hat equals 1. So how am I going to realise this on this figure now? Well, I could simply just define where the end of the rod is going to lie, but what I'm going to want to do is use my convenient measuring tool to decide where I'm going to put the end of the rod. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place the end of the rod at this point, which essentially means realising that this ds squared curve which I've drawn is the curve ds squared equals 1, because the value of ds squared at that point corresponds to the end point of the rod, and so the value is 1, regardless of the coordinates we're using. And so my rod is going to lie somewhere like this, on this figure. Simply, this point here on our figure is going to be the point x hat equals 1. And now what we do, because we've realised our line element is invariant for both of these frames, if I now conveniently use the line element to first of all measure the endpoint of this rod, so I intersect my line element with the point x hat equals 1, so I then know that this ds squared value is also 1. Now this is really useful because I can then look at where this ds squared which is a constant, intersects any other set of axes. So I immediately have to know that where it intersects is also going to have to correspond to the length of 1. 
And so in our A coordinates, in the X coordinates, I can realize that where this ds squared equals one curve intersects on my x axis is also going to have to correspond to the point x equals one. And so what we've now effectively realized is that our so now just to be really clear, on this diagram measured along the x hat axis, this is the coordinate value x hat equals one. And now, because the line element is invariant, regardless of the frame, I can draw one of these figures, and I can see where it intersects, and I can then call the value of the line elements where it intersects for one axis to be x hat equals 1. And then, because the line element is invariant, for any other frame, wherever it intersects, we're also going to have to correspond to the same value, and so the coordinate value here is also x equals 1. But now, what we have to realise, these are just the coordinate values which these two observers are associating with the length of this, or the end point of this rod rather. We can now quite clearly see that if these two observers were to just in their own reference frame now measure the length of this rod. Well, we know that first of all, in the rest frame, the observer is going to say, okay, well, I have a length delta L of 1. Okay, so we have on this figure now both of our frames drawn coinciding with their origins, and this is now going to be quite useful because we can essentially measure distances along each of these individual axes and we can use them to compare. Now what we should realise is that if we just simply measure a distance along a single axis, essentially the metric of just a single axis is just an identity matrix, it's just a, a one, and so we can kind of now be really careful to associate now, what would be a Euclidean length, so just simply the Euclidean length of this interval in one frame, we can compare its Euclidean length in another frame, because we're simply measuring along a single axis, and we're just juxtaposing the two axes on the same figure. Now, just quite clearly from this picture, we can already see that this rod, at least from the perspective of our now A frame, they're going to think it is this long, but from the perspective of the B frame, they're going to think it's slightly longer in their reference frame, just comparing now these two Euclidean distances. So I could maybe call this distance delta x e with a subscript for Euclidean, and then this delta x hat e as just pure coordinate intervals these are both going to have the length of one or a coordinate interval value of one but now the physical length which remember we would achieve by plugging this interval into some kind of metric the physical length of these two coordinate intervals is going to be different because Essentially, they're being measured using different coordinate systems. So whilst they might appear to have the same coordinate length, their actual physical or Euclidean lengths that extend along a single spatial axis are going to differ. And so we can already quite clearly see this. That observer A is going to think that this length is slightly shorter than it actually is in the stationary frame. And so now we can go through and use our Lorentz transformation to derive this a bit more rigorously. But just to summarise how drawing a picture like this can be used quite nicely, essentially we can juxtapose both of our frames on top of each other, choose their origins to be at the same place, and this then conveniently lets us 
talk about intervals simply just by giving the coordinates of points. And then we took a fixed coordinate interval in the B frame, which we saw appeared on the figure as kind of lying along the X hat axis, somewhere like this. And then we used our ds squared measuring stick to first of all work out, well, we, we can just plot these ds squared curves, see where they intersect one of our coordinate systems, and then realize, okay, because we're measuring along a single axis, the length of this rod, or the coordinate length rather, is going to directly correspond to the value of the line element. And then once we've fixed the value of the line element from one coordinate system, that fixed value is going to translate into another coordinate system. And so looking at where that fixed ds squared, how it appears as a coordinate value, we can see that we know that this coordinate point is going to be the coordinate point x equals 1. And now by being really careful with the Euclidean argument, we can see that these coordinate intervals are actually talking about different physical distances. If we realise we're going to associate physical distances with a Euclidean distance. And we can do this Euclidean reasoning because we're only talking about spatial parts of our diagram. We're not ever talking about time-like parts where we're going to have a, a minus introduced into our line element. And so we can fairly uh, fairly happily convey, compare these space-like distances in our traditional Euclidean um, way. So that was just a geometric way to see length contraction. Now let's just go through and derive it using our Lorentz transformations.